My name is James Blair. Uh, I work for the OpenStack Foundation, um, but more importantly, I'm on the infrastructure team for the OpenStack project, which is a extremely open uh, cross-organizational team that works together to facilitate the operation of the OpenStack project uh, as a development organization. So um, I'll, I guess I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, these other people on the slide uh, are not speaking today, but these slides, like everything we do, uh, are part of a public Git repository. They're all uh, shared, we all contribute to them. So their names are up here because they have contributed something to this and given some version of this talk elsewhere. Um, and they're also the other uh, core members of the infrastructure team. Uh, and as you can see, there's you know, a pretty, some pretty good representation there. Two of uh, those people work for HP, two of them work for the OpenStack Foundation, and we hope to put some more people on the team from other organizations soon. Um, so this is not a talk about OpenStack. So I'll talk really quickly about OpenStack. Um, OpenStack is, uh, in case you haven't heard of it, it's open source software for building public or private clouds. Um, so basically we're, we're talking uh, virtual compute, storage, networking, identity management uh, components that you can uh, put together using APIs and build large uh, data center spanning applications out of them. Um, the components of OpenStack are uh, varied and numerous. Uh, over here on the left you can see uh, the, the our, our list of server projects. So these are, are kind of the major components of OpenStack. Like I mentioned, compute, object storage, there's images, identity management, uh, network service, and so forth. I won't read them all. Uh, most of them have client libraries that go along with them uh, so that you can actually interface with them either from the command line or, or at an application API level. And, and this is kind of the first challenge of uh, development in the context of the OpenStack project. Um, we keep calling it one project, uh, but it's composed of many, many projects <coughs> that, that exist not only in their own Git repos, but they, they kind of have their own uh, development community around them. Uh, you know, there's a group of people who are more focused on Nova than, say, Swift, and, and so forth. So uh, a lot of our, our challenge as, as a whole project is to enable these individual projects to keep doing what they need to do, but then at the end of the day, make sure all these things work together, uh, that we can put them together and, and, and build a, an actual cloud out of all of the individual components. And, and then just to sort of uh, make sure that the development methodology uh, is shared amongst all of these projects to, to reduce friction between collaboration of all the different components. Uh, so this is, you know, it's kind of a case study in, in how to do uh, large-scale development uh, in, you know, where, where you, where you're, uh, I guess, large-scale development of a componentized system. Um, in addition to all of those uh, Git repos that we have for individual technical efforts, we have some cross-project sort of horizontal efforts, um, including documentation, uh, infrastructure, which is what I'm talking about here today, uh, we have uh, we have a, a project specifically to, to deal with uh, uh, reuse and abstraction of common uh, ideas across OpenStack projects themselves. So it turns out when you have um, 60 Git repos and and they're all kind of doing similar things, people start to copy code around them and, and develop new ideas. And so we actually have an effort to make sure that that's that's minimized. We you know uh, they're, they're folks that, that find that code, factor it out into new external libraries, and that's the, the Oslo uh, project. Of course, uh, QA uh, is, a, is a horizontal effort, uh, especially in the realm of integration testing. There is, um, there is a project that does have its own Git repo called Tempest that, uh, that does integration testing with all of the OpenStack components. Uh, and, and so it's good to have a team that's, that's focused on making sure that all of the projects are, are uh, participating in that effort. Uh, release management, um, it is a team. Uh, it's spearheaded by a, a singular individual named Thierry, who, who is a, an, an amazing person who's extremely detail-oriented. And so he makes sure that, that as we approach our release deadlines, all of the projects have, have hit their milestones and, and things like that. 
Uh, we have uh, an internationalization team and a vulnerability management team, as you'd expect. So uh, basically, you know, t to date, these are all of the, the, the horizontal efforts that we've seen necessary to, to try to integrate all of those uh, individual components uh, together. A uh, bit about our release management. Uh, we borrowed a lot, of, uh, a lot of things from Ubuntu when we started the project. So we started with timed base uh, releases. Every six months, we decided we would uh, release a, a, a complete version of the system. Um, we named it after, uh, after the year and, uh, and release number, similar to, to Ubuntu. So we're actually we're, we're working on the first release of 2014 now. So it's 2014.1. Um, and we, <laughs> we also have code names for our releases that are named for, uh, for the, the geographic locations where we have design summits, uh, which again is another thing that we borrowed from Ubuntu. So every, every six months right after a release, um, we, we, uh, we all get together uh, and try to figure out what we're going to be doing for the next six months. So we try to, we try to um, make the most of that by uh, coming up with with plans for the kind of work that we want to do over the next six months, uh, sort of rough plans uh, in advance. And then uh, we all sit down in a place for several days, uh, I think about four days, and, um, and uh, basically lock ourselves in dark rooms uh, and, uh, and go, go into those plans in detail. And by the end of that, we should know how, uh, what we're going to be working on for the next six months. And this is really important <laughs> since uh, we have um, a lot of different folks from different organizations working on the project. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot less of um, going down to the, to the break room and chatting with somebody or having um, weekly meetings or, or that sort of thing. So th these design summits are very important for syncing up uh, as, as uh, as a project um, with what we're doing. Um, we actually, we just released uh, the, the Havana release of OpenStack, which is um, not named because we had our design <coughs> summit in Cuba. We actually had it in Oregon and there's a Havana, Oregon, as it turns out. Um, possibly wishful thinking when we named it. Uh, so we also have um, milestone releases uh, within that six month window. Every, every few months or so, we, we sort of checkpoint our progress and make sure that we're, we're keeping up with what, we've, what we decided we would do at the previous design summit. And then finally, after a release, uh, of course, they're, they're not perfect. They're supposed to be perfect, but they're not. So we have uh, stable branches that we fork off and, um, and we maintain those for a period of time with um, security and bug fix updates. Um, I, I sort of got into this a little bit on the previous slide, but our contributors are rather varied. Uh, there's, there's a pie chart which may or may not be representative at this point. It's honestly, it's changing all the time. Um, but we have uh, uh, folks from, yeah. as you can see, Red Hat, HP, IBM, Rackspace, several other uh, companies, um, independent folks working on the project. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting having so many people from so many different organizations and backgrounds uh, working on this thing. It's also a bit of a challenge uh, because they, all of these people come to OpenStack development with their own expectations, their own goals. Um, you know, they, they, might be, they might be just focused on um, some subsystem their, their company specializes in. Others might be uh, more interested in, in the functioning of the system as a whole, or can you take this system and bundle it up and deploy it in a certain way? Uh, so there's, there's room for everybody, um, but we, you know, how, how do we coordinate that work and, and make sure that it's not just a mess is, is quite a bit of a challenge. And of course, the, the, the quantity and the quality of the contributions are varied. We have um, uh, old school expert Python programmers uh, working on this and people who have never written a line of Python in their life, um, you know, uh, join up and start submitting patches. And so we, we try to be a pretty welcoming community. Uh, so we, we also, you know, try to facilitate uh, onboarding new people and sort of um, gently bringing them into the, the, the system. Uh, to do that, uh, we focus a lot on the uh, consistency around our tooling. Uh, the infrastructure team in particular 
uh, focuses on meta development. It's an area that we're very interested in. Uh, so we, we kind of focus that, that energy uh, in this team. And so all of the individual Git repositories, all of the individual projects aren't spending all of their time figuring out, well, how do I bundle this up into a release? How do I, uh, how do I build a framework around testing? Things like that. So uh, we, in the infrastructure team, we focus on doing that uh, for the project as a whole and, and concentrate that development so that, um, so that it's consistent for everybody and it's easy for new developers to um, not only onboard onto OpenStack as a, as a project, but move, move between the different components. If, they, uh, if, if they're working on uh, the compute system and they need to uh, dive into the networking system because it turns out they interact. Uh, so making that sort of thing consistent is, is important. Um, so here's, here's some of the stuff we run uh, as part of our developer infrastructure. Um, it turns out there's a lot, and um, I'm not going to talk about every one of these. But uh, I guess the, the high-level high categories are um, things about, around code review and managing our Git repositories. Um, we do test and build automation. That's together because uh, we use the same kind of automation for running tests as we do for building release artifacts and so forth. Um, we, we do a lot of work to minimize the, the disruption of the external internet on our uh, development process uh, because it, you know, we, we depend on um, packages from, Py OpenStack is written in Python, by the way. So we, uh, we download a lot of packages from PyPy as part of our building and testing. And so uh, we need to make sure that we can do that reliably. Uh, we, we get uh, OS images for testing and things like that. So we have to, to, to cache all of these things because it turns out that the internet is not terribly reliable when you're trying to do uh, the same thing uh, thousands and thousands of times a day um, consistently. Uh, job logs is, uh, and, and build artifacts, that's a really interesting um, thing that I'm gonna get into later. Um, how, how do you, when you, when you run tests and builds at the scale that we do, what do you do with all of the logs? What, you know, how, can you, how can you make use of those? Um, of course, we build documentation uh, uh, and, and, and we publish it. Um, we build releases. Uh, we run IRC bots. Um, the, the OpenStack projects um, themselves use IRC extensively. Uh, to, to, it's one of the ways that we can communicate uh, with developers from various organizations in real time. So uh, while we don't have a water cooler, we do have IRC, and uh, that turns out to be a very good substitute. Um, and uh, in the, we have a, in a channel for the folks who are focusing on infrastructure too, and it's actually one of the, the busiest channels because we're, we're not only um, building and maintaining the system, but we're sort of the uh, de facto help desk for new developers. So we're, we're always around to help people who are just um, starting with this system. Um, all of the, the teams have uh, weekly or bi-weekly meetings, uh, again, in IRC, uh, so that they're accessible for everybody uh, and they're logged and recorded. You can go back and, and see the meetings. Uh, the project itself has a governance structure uh, a technical committee that meets that uh, also meets weekly in IRC. Uh, that's where we make sort of project-wide decisions. Um, we run some blogs because people like writing about this stuff. Uh, mailing lists, uh, an Etherpad server, a paste bin. Uh, all of these things are really helpful with uh, the kind of collaborative development that we do. Uh, and finally, authentication for our uh, um, our all of our tools, because we have a lot of them, and we like you to be able to, to just log in once and, and use all of them. Uh, and then um, we manage um, bugs and uh, future development work in Blueprints in Launchpad. Um, so the typical development environment for an OpenStack developer is uh, obviously Python, as I mentioned. Um, we run all of our tests on uh, the the long-term support releases. So uh, we run into on CentOS um, 6.2, not 2.6. Uh, 
um, and, uh, and um, Ubuntu Precise. Uh, so that sort of covers our, it's kind of the lowest common denominator for, for what we're trying to support as a project. Um, we, all of our projects are PEP8 compliant. PEP8 is the style guide for Python. Uh, which sounds like a minor thing, but when you have uh, so many developers working on a project, uh, having a style guide just sort of, it, it puts so many arguments to rest before they start. Um, you know, we, we don't have arguments about how many tabs or, or spaces you should have. Um, we have a tool that enforces that automatically and so that people don't have to deal with that sort of thing. Uh, I mentioned also earlier the, the, the common libraries. Um, and then uh, we use uh, virtual ENV uh, quite extensively to, uh, to pull in all of the Python dependencies when we run tests. Uh, we also use a tool called Tox, which actually manages the creation of a virtual ENV and then the installation of the software into it. Um, that's actually made it so that we can be very consistent about how we bootstrap an environment for testing. So you can. Uh, we have our, our Jenkins servers running talks to run the unit test suite, and you can run the same thing on your uh, workstation um, and, and, and get ideally the same results. I mentioned uh, IRC, we were on the Freenode network earlier. We have a cool, uh, sorry, a, a, a cool tool called DevStack, which um, basically what it does is it takes all, all of the OpenStack repositories and downloads them and installs them. So uh, if, you're, if you're trying to develop on OpenStack and you're not using it in a production situation, or even if you're just like, hey, what's this OpenStack thing? I wanna play around with it. I don't, I don't wanna read anything. I just wanna like start breaking stuff to find out what it is. That's, I don't know about you, that's how I learned. Um, you can download this tool called DevStack from devstack.org. And uh, it's basically uh, a shell script that gets all of the, the stuff and installs it uh, and, and leaves you with a, a functioning OpenStack system at the end. Um, don't run it on your primary workstation because it'll destroy it. But you know, get, a, get a VM or a container of some sort and, and run it inside of that. And you'll have, um, within a couple of minutes, a working installation of the, the full OpenStack system with all the components. And we use that same tool in our integration test suite. So, uh, so that we know that this thing always works. We know that it's always able to, to produce a, you know, a working version of OpenStack. Um, and we have a, a system called Project Gating, uh, which is uh, basically the idea is that we don't let anything merge to uh, a code repository unless it passes uh, tests. So it's, uh, it's kind of a simple idea, but it's a powerful one. It's great for developers because it means that you, you never start your day um, sort of checking out the code and then figuring out what somebody broke last night because uh, they pushed it into the tree and didn't run the test. Uh, you always know that, that, that every commit to the repository works, at least. It always passes the unit tests. Um, and it's a very egalitarian system. We don't have a BDFL. Um, you know, we don't have any single person who's uh, who is in charge of all this stuff and gets to flaunt the rules and say, well, I, I didn't run tests on this, but I'm sure it works, so I'm gonna push it in. Um, that, that physically can't happen with our system. Uh, everybody is subject to the same, uh, the same requirements that, that a test pass, sorry, a change pass test before it merges. Um, Everything that we do is automated because we're, you know, we're lazy sysadmins. Um, we don't like to do things manually. And whenever we end up having to do something manually, we, we botch it up. Um, we're terrible at it. So uh, here's, here's a quick shot of the, uh, the tool that we use to drive a lot of our automation. It's called Zool. And uh, it drives not only the project gating system that I talked about, but it, it also does things like um, build documentation and publish it at, at whenever a commit lands, um, it uh, builds releases and pushes them to PyPy and, and that sort of thing. Here's the uh, process flow for uh, a developer when they're working on a, a change. It's a little bit different than, than what you would consider the, the normal workflow if you're, say, used to GitHub. Um, it turns out Git supports a lot of different workflows uh, equally well. 
so this one's this one's a little different than than GitHub, but uh, it works out really well for the the tools that we're using. So you start obviously by cloning uh, a copy of a repository. Um, I think I'm going to use a printer here. Yeah. Uh, so you know you've got the 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 Nova repository and you clone it down into your local environment, and um, then what we do is we ask developers to to start a new topic branch. Um, that's you know basically it's it's going to get awkward if you start trying to do your development on master for reasons I'll, I'll explain in a minute but um, you start a new topic branch you um, you write your code you ideally run the unit test suite but hey you don't have to we've got programs that'll do that for you um, and then you uh, you commit to your local branch then you use a tool called git review which is um, something that we wrote which uh, will take the outstanding commits in your repository and push them up to Garrett, which is our code review system. Um, once, once you sort of get in the habit of just like writing something and then typing git review and then going in and writing something else and typing git review again, it gets, it's, it's really kind of addictive. It's a really low friction way of, of writing code and pushing it up for peer review. So anyway, once you, you type, once you run git review, it sends it up to, to Garrett. Um, where immediately our Jenkins system, driven by Zool, will start um, automatically testing uh, your change. So the idea is, is as soon as a new change comes in, developers, uh, reviewers are going to want to, to know whether it passes tests or not. And so it gets started on that right away. Um, eventually it's gonna come back and leave a comment in Garrett saying, yeah, this passed or failed tests and so forth. Uh, then, then um, reviewers come along. Uh, our system is, is based heavily on code review. They actually, the reviewers have, um, I guess, the most power in the system in terms of they're the ones who decide what gets merged or what doesn't in OpenStack components. So uh, anybody in the world is welcome to log in our Garrett and start reviewing code. Uh, you can leave, you can leave um, sort of advisory votes of plus or minus one. I like this, I don't like this. You can leave comments about specific things that, that should be changed. We have uh, what we call core review teams for every project, which are composed of senior developers who ideally know uh, in, in great detail what's going on in indi any of the individual projects. And uh, they can come along and leave uh, plus two or minus two votes, which are basically binding. A minus two means this can't merge. Uh, a plus two uh, means that it can, and we require two votes from uh, two different core developers before a change will merge. Um, so then uh, once core developers decide that uh, a change is appropriate to be merged, they approve it. Uh, it goes back to Jenkins for one last round of testing because this could have taken a while. Um, things might have changed in, since the last time the change ran. Uh, moreover, things are probably going to change between the time somebody approves the change and the, the time Jenkins is finished running it. So we actually have quite a bit of uh, work around making sure that the, the change is merged as tested in the repository. And I'll get to that in, in a minute. Uh, but anyway, once it does pass tests, it uh, finally gets merged into master and you've uh, closed the loop, so to speak. Um, so Garrett, as I mentioned, is, uh, it's a key part of our uh, system. It's it's kind of the, it's where developers spend and code reviewers spend most of their time interacting with the system. Uh, we try to make sure that that uh, every part of the the system that interacts with with working with a change, um, whether that's code review or automated testing systems or whatever else. Um, interfaces through Garrett so that we, we're focusing all of the information about a change in one place for developers. Uh, so anyway, Garrett is a uh, standalone code review system developed by Google for the Android open source project. project. Um, it's been really great to work with because of its, its highly flexible uh, integration points. It, you, you can add um, commit hooks uh, as you'd expect with Git, but uh, you can also, uh, it has a, an event stream interface where you SSH into the thing and it, it spits little JSON blobs of information at you uh, whenever anything interesting happens, like when a new patch set is uploaded or, uh, or somebody leaves a comment or something like that. Uh, and then it has extensive, extensible review categories. So out of the box, it comes with um, verified in code review, but you can add others. Um, 
So for example, you can say like changes need to go through a licensing review check or something like that. And, and you can add all of these categories as your workflow demands. Uh, so here's um, some screenshots of Garrett. Uh, this is sort of the, the, the top part of the page where you can see general information about the change. Uh, it's, it's got information like the person who, who, who wrote it, uh, the project branch, uh, the topic, when it was updated, its status, et cetera. Here's the commit message, right? So you, know, you, you start by reading a commit message and figure out whether you can actually understand what this thing's talking about or not. Um, down here, we have all of the, the people who've reviewed and left uh, comments on it. Uh, so um, you can see that this, these people left you know, plus one reviews. Um, this guy, the check mark here is, check mark is Garrett speak for plus two some reason. Um, so anyway, this is a, uh, this is a plus two uh, from this guy, and here's a, a plus two from, from Jenkins, uh, meaning it passed the unit test. And remember how I said we require two plus two reviews from core reviewers? This, this apparently is the exception to the rule. I'm sure they had a very good reason for only approving this with, with one. Um, so anyway, uh, Daniel decided that this was okay to merge, and, and so it, it got merged in. Um, Another thing Garrett provides, obviously, is a, uh, a, a diff view of the changes themselves. So um, we, most of us like side-by-side -side diffs, and that's what it does by default. Um, so you can see here they just uh, changed you know, this line down here um, as such. Uh, it's highly configurable. If you like some other kind of diff, it'll, it'll show that to you. Uh, it's got syntax highlighting for most major languages and, and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a really good way to, uh, to, to review code. And you can also uh, click on each of these lines and, and leave inline comments uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, we have Garrett integrated with uh, Launchpad, which is our bug tracking tool. So anytime you upload a change that, that uh, mentions a bug in a certain way in the commit message, we'll, we'll hook it up to Launchpad so that you can you can look at a bug and, and say, oh, well, somebody proposed a, uh, a commit to address this bug. Uh, so uh, it links back to, to Garrett automatically, uh, and it helps keep these two systems in sync. Um, here's uh, another page from Garrett, where Garrett has a lot of features for querying reviews, for, for sort of dealing with uh, your, your workflow. Um, we have custom dashboards that try to help prioritize reviews in, in certain ways. But the, the gist is there's various ways that you can get Garrett to, to show you a, a list of um, patches that you know, are in, in various <coughs> states. So the one that's highlighted is a, is a change that's passed the initial tests, and it has at least one um, positive code review from a core member, uh, but it still hasn't been approved yet. Uh, so. That's, that, that's a change where if you're a core member, you might say, oh, well, maybe I should look at this and see if it's ready to go in. Um, and then, you know, obviously these other changes haven't been, they haven't even had their test run on them yet. Uh, this one had its test run and it came back with a failure. So um, I mentioned Git review a little bit earlier. Uh, we, we wrote this um, to, 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 um, to make interacting with Garrett easier for, for new developers. Um, Garrett is, it's very easy to interact with if you're a Git expert, because basically it's, it's just a Git server and it has special magical refs. And if you push your refs to um, these magic refs on Git, it will create patch sets for you. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, when you, if you're into hacking that kind of infrastructure, it's, it's a dream because uh, it, it makes a lot of sense in, in terms of Git and, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with that. That's not necessarily what you want to teach every new developer. You don't necessarily want to teach them how to, you know, Git push, head refs, Garrett, etc. Um, so we wrote this tool that, that acts as a Git subcommand and, um, and basically all you have to do is, is make your commit and then type Git review and then here's, here's the output from Garrett about how it you know it created a new change, and uh, and pushed it up. 
So, in fact, right there you can see the, the special magic ref that Garrett uses. So it's it basically it, this means create a ref, uh, create a new change for the master branch with the topic of bug one nine or sorry nine one six zero one eight. So um, you can, if you're using Garrett, uh, Git review doesn't require any of the other infrastructure that we're talking about. Um, it's uh, it's, an, again, a simple Python script, and it's actually in Fedora and Ubuntu, so you can even just apt-git or yum install git review, uh, and you'll have it. Or you can pip install git review to get, it, get the latest version from PyPy. Um, and it also uh, auto-configures itself. It's kind of a zero configuration kind of thing. Uh, if you have a special file in your repository that tells it the Garrett server to talk to, it'll do all of its configuration automatically. Um, so, as you might have figured out, a lot of our infrastructure is around testing uh, because testing this project is is complicated and it's only getting harder as it gets bigger. Uh, so we we try to you know sort of as a service for developers run lots of uh, tests easily for them uh, just by pushing up a new commit. Uh, we we start running tests. Um, the main kinds of tests we run are unit tests, uh, which. Um, you know, they're, they're designed to, to run inside of um, contained environments. You should be able to run it on your workstation. It shouldn't be going and, and, and doing any like sudo commands behind your back. Um, it should be quick and easy for a developer to run. Um, quick varies over time. Uh, I think some of our projects take 10 or 20 minutes to run unit tests at this point. But nonetheless, uh, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, sort of a a, a, um, an easy thing for developers to do. Integration tests are a little bit harder. Uh, like I said, we use the DevStack tool for that, and that basically trashes an entire virtual machine in order to do the tests. Um, so it's a little more involved for a developer to run if, if they don't already have this uh, set up. And so basically what we do is, uh, um, you know, we, we spin up virtual machines and install the stuff and, and run it for them so that developers don't have to. Um, so some specific challenges that we've had to deal with around testing uh, are, uh, as I sort of alluded to earlier, is, is we want to test the effect of merging a change. We don't, we don't want to test that your change works against the state of the repository now. We want to test that when your change merges in the future with everything else that might be merging around the same time, is the, reposit is the repository still going to work? And that turns out to be a little bit of a challenge, and I'll talk about how we address that in a few minutes. Um, also, our infrastructure is entirely virtualized. Um, we, we run it on OpenStack clouds, so we're eating our own dog food. Um, and so uh, we actually have a couple of different uh, OpenStack cloud providers that uh, give us free accounts where we run all of these uh, tests. Um, and so just, you know, we're, we're kind of, a big value proposition of OpenStack is this is you know supposed to be a provider independent system. It's supposed to help avoid vendor lock-in, and so we're really putting that to the test by running our infrastructure transparently across at least two different cloud providers. Um, uh, we have a large number of very similar projects, so we get really tired of typing the same thing over and over. So we try to build a system that is amenable to templating and uh, uh, dealing with standardization and then repetition of that standardization. Uh, and then uh, finally, we have um, not only in, in our own cloud providers, uh, which provide us slightly different versions of, of um, you know, computing resources, uh, there's also, there are a lot of different ways that one might choose to run OpenStack on a lot of different hardware configurations. And we would like people to be able to test that as well and provide feedback. Um, so one of the things that we do to address the, um, the, the, the question about testing the, the effect of the change as opposed to the, the current state of the change is uh, we wrote a script, a script called Garrett Git Prep. And um, basically what it does is it uh, is it is it puts the the tree in the configuration that it's going to be in after this change lands, um, which isn't a terribly difficult thing to do. Except occasionally, 
um, this change might be landing ahead of a couple of other changes. And so we need to make sure that they're in the tree as well. Um, and in some situations when we're doing, doing integration testing, we have uh, other projects which they may have tests that are in process as well. So we need to make sure that all of the projects uh, represent their, their proposed future state uh, for every change before it lands, before we start testing it. Um, so uh, we, we have a, a script called devstackgate, which kind of takes uh, the Garrett git prep uh, idea to the next level and puts all of those related projects in the, in the state that they're supposed to be. Um, so, so that we know that um, that when you're changing, when you're making a change to Nova, it, it's it's testing uh, it's testing that change as well as any changes that um, that people might be making to change to a Keystone or some other tool at the same time. Um, so when we started doing this, we ran into some problems. Um, our tests are slow. Our our uh, I think. At the worst, our integration tests maxed out at taking about an hour and a half. Uh, right now, they take 45 minutes, and that's after um, uh, quite a bit of effort to, to get things running in parallel. So um, if, as you can imagine, if you're trying to test every change before it lands, and it takes on the order of an hour to test a change, uh, if you just sort of did this in the naive way, serially, you'd, you'd only be able to land 24 changes in a day. And we like to land a lot more than that some days. So, uh, so we had to deal with that problem. Um, cloud API calls can fail. Um, they, they fail a lot. It turns out that's one of the features of a cloud is uh, that it's you know, eventually consistent. Um, it, it, it might fail at any time. You're kind of expected to, to, to deal with that. Um, that failure. Uh, Netflix has sort of famously popularized this idea of being prepared for failure at any time with their, their Chaos Monkey tool. Um, so when we started spinning up um, tens of thousands of machines every day to run these tests, we ran into these kinds of problems. And so we you know, had to start building robust tools to make sure that, that, that they could deal with failure at, at every conceivable uh, opportunity. Uh, and then external services are unreliable. I, I talked about this a little bit earlier where uh, we can't, if we're running thousands of tests every day, we can't necessarily depend on downloading um, every dependency that we need from PyPy or from the Ubuntu archive or something like that. And frankly, it would just be rude anyway to download quite so many all the time. So um, so we, we came up with some uh, caching and mirroring solutions to, to help uh, deal with those. So um, one of the things that, we're, uh, that we do to um, try to keep the system moving smoothly is, uh, is we spin up nodes uh, beforehand for testing. So we actually have a pool of nodes at any given time that are, that are ready to have tests uh, start running on them at, at any point. Um, so what we do is uh, the, the whole process for that is we, we spin up a new node in a cloud, just a base, say a base Ubuntu uh, image. We get all of the, the packages and repositories that we need and we cache them locally on that node. Then we snapshot that to an image in the cloud. And so basically we've, we now have an image that represents um, a base system plus all of the things that we're likely to need. Um, then we spin up nodes from that image. Uh, and like I said, those are ready to run uh, at, any, at any time. Um, and when a job comes along that needs to run on one of those, it, gets, it starts running that job. Uh, and then when it's done, we delete it because we don't, we don't really want to bother cleaning it up. Um, we don't know if the cleanup's going to work. We don't know what kind of state the node is going to be left in at the end, especially if the job failed. Um, so we just get rid of it because it's cloud, right? Um, there's more where that came from. So, um, uh, so those are the, the, the main things that we've, we've done to, to speed up that process. Um, now that we've got all of those tests running as quickly as we can, um, we still want to be able to merge changes even faster. Uh, so we wrote a system called Zool, which is a general purpose trunk gating system. Um, and its kind of mind warping feature is that it does um, speculative execution of, of tests. So it kind of, it, it runs a lot of tests in parallel and assumes that they're all going to pass. And if they, if they all do pass, then that's great because all of those changes can merge. Um, and if they don't pass, 
then uh, then it goes back and it figures out um, you know what which which change uh, failed and it kicks that out and and it um, runs through again. Um, so this is uh, this is kind of what I just said, uh, but uh, I have a, a quick little uh, simulation for those who are more graphically inclined uh, like I am. Um, so you can imagine you've got two projects, Nova and Keystone here, um, and you've got a commit there representing the, the head of each of those projects. Um, and then somebody comes along and uh, starts approving changes to these projects. So um, somebody approved four changes, two of them to Nova, then one to Keystone, and then another one to Nova, right? So these are both OpenStack components, and uh, we know that they they relate to each other. Uh, Nova needs Keystone in order to, to um, Keystone is identity management, right? So, so in order to even authenticate to Nova to do something, you need to use Keystone. So these, these two projects are related, which means that we need to, to be careful about how we're testing changes to them because changes to one project can break the other. So, um, so what Zool does is as these things are approved, it, it puts them in this, uh, this virtual uh, queue and it starts running tests for all of them in parallel. Um, and what, what is found here is that the first two changes work just fine, uh, and then the two after that, um, they failed their tests for some reason. Um, so unfortunately, Zool doesn't know whether the, change is the, the change number four failed its test because there's a fault in change number four, or if there is a fault in change number three, because they're, like I said, they're, they're related. So at this point, what Zool does is it, well, it knows change number three has failed. So it's going to shift it out of, uh, out of its virtual queue. And then it's going to test uh, number four again, but based on the assumption that three isn't going to merge. So it's, it's, it's going to, the future state of the repository at this point is changes one, two, and four. And this time it actually did pass tests, so presumably the reason it failed before was because there was actually a, a fault in, in Keystone. So once uh, the tests are, are done running, Zool starts uh, reporting these changes back to Garrett and it says, you know, these, these two changes passed uh, their tests and everything ahead of them passed, so they get to merge. This one did not pass its test and, uh, and so it just gets reported back with negative feedback to, to Garrett. And then finally number four gets to merge um, because it was, its final test was only based on the, the other changes that, uh, that did pass. So, um, Zool has a very flexible configuration uh, syntax. It basically has very little understanding of, of the workflow that we use it for out of the box. So we, um, we've built all of the, these concepts out of, uh, of very simple configuration primitives. So we, we basically define, define pipelines for all of the different kinds of actions that we're gonna be doing. So uh, the thing that I just demonstrated was uh, what we call the gate pipeline, where a change gets, um, um, uh, sorry, a change gets uh, merged uh, after testing. But we use it for, for other kinds of automation as well. The check pipeline is what I alluded to earlier with uh, where we, we, chain, uh, we test changes as soon as they're uploaded. Um, and then uh, the post and release pipelines are, as you'd expect, the, the post pipeline runs post merge jobs like build the documentation and publish it. And then the release pipeline ru runs things like build a tarball and, um, and possibly even upload it to PyPy or something like that. Uh, we have a lot of jobs in our Jenkins. We have many hundreds of jobs. I've forgotten how many, but it's um, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 or something like that. I, it's, I think it might be more than 1,000. Um, but at any rate, the, we have so many jobs because we have so many projects, and every project has a set of very similar jobs. So we, um, about the, the about the time we were getting close to 100 jobs in Jenkins, we said to ourselves, okay, this idea of logging into a web interface for a Java app and clicking around to create new jobs and change their configurations and whatnot, um, that's gonna get old really fast as we add new projects. So we started working on something called Jenkins Job Builder. And uh, basically what it does is uh, 
we, we manage all of our jobs as YAML files in Git. And so it's really easy to, to, to sort of to think about these and um, abstract them into templates and then apply those templates to all of our different projects. And uh, it's also really easy to give access to, um, to anyone. So whereas traditionally in Jenkins, uh, you have to have some kind of administrator access to log in and change jobs, um, that just seemed kind of elitist to us. So instead, what we uh, built is a system where anybody can uh, check out a copy of or clone a copy of our Git repo, change the YAML for these jobs, uh, and then propose that change up to Garrett and we'll code review and, and merge it. And uh, once it's merged, it automatically gets deployed out to, to Jenkins. Um, so here's an example job template. Uh, here's a PEP8 job. Like I mentioned before, that's the Python style uh, checker. So it's, it's pretty simple. We basically say, you know, this, this job, its name is going to be gate something PEP8, and then the name is going to be filled in later with the name of the project. So it'll be like gate Nova PEP8 or gate Swift PEP8, et cetera. Um, it's got a couple of builder build steps in Jenkins. Uh, it's going to run the Garrett Git prep script that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then it's going to run the, the, our standard PEP8 script, which is basically just going to run talks dash e pep8. Uh, and then when it's done, um, publish the console log somewhere. So this is, this is about all it takes to write a, a simple Jenkins job. Um, this, again, the system is pretty generic. It's not really tied to any of the rest of our infrastructure. So um, we actually have a lot of people contributing uh, changes for bits of Jenkins that they need to manage. So it's actually a quite featureful system. And there's a question back there. Uh, so at the moment we have um, we have a few Jenkins masters uh, that have all of the jobs, uh, and then each of those masters have a couple of hundred slaves attached to them. Um, we're sort of uh, we're we could divide uh, divide it up in uh, several ways. We could we could uh, do jobs. We could have a master for a project. We could have a master. Um, we could actually have all masters and no slaves, um, but right now, sort of based on hysterical reasons and uh, and the the direction that we're we're going, oh wow, I have two minutes left. Um, we have uh, a like I said, a, a a couple of masters with a bunch of slaves attached to them. We're kind of exploring the lim the scaling limits of of Jenkins. We found that that after a couple of hundred slaves, uh, Jenkins itself. Uh, becomes untenable to run at that scale. So that's actually why we have uh, a couple of Jenkins masters at this point. So. Do, all the, do all the masters run basically all the job sets? Or? Yes. Yeah. And, and so one of the reasons that, that we're doing it that way at the moment is uh, our, our system for spinning up nodes for the dev stack jobs uh, is really good at just, uh, it, it spins up new nodes and then attaches them to, to Jenkins's, uh, Jenkins masters. So, uh, so that's that. I know it, make, it makes a certain amount of sense for the way that we're spinning up those nodes and attaching them, um, but nothing that we're doing really assumes that kind of topology. Um, so, anyway, once you've written a template, you can say, "Hey, there's this project called Nova, and it needs to run uh, the Python jobs. It needs to run that Pep8 job. It needs to run translation jobs, things like that." And so, this is basically on a small scale, exactly what our configuration looks like. It says, you know, for each of our projects, these are all the jobs that you need to run. Um, there's a really cool thing that we're doing. Um, now that we're running uh, something like um, a thousand, we're deploying like a thousand OpenStack clouds every day for testing. They generate an enormous amount of logs, like a couple of terabytes for every development cycle. And that's, that, that's after we've compressed them and pruned them and things like that. Um, so uh, this is kind of new territory because most, most CI systems don't um, build that kind of, uh, that kind of, they don't generate that kind of data as a byproduct. So we're sort of exploring what can we do with this? You know, we've, we've, we've now got the equivalent of, of a huge amount of production data uh, just from running our tests. So can we mine that data 
and do things like identify, automatically identify failures, um, either ones that we know about or possibly even ones that we haven't discovered yet. Uh, so we actually have a lot of uh, uh, people looking into uh, creating tools that deal with that kind of stuff, and it's it's pretty exciting. And we basically use Elasticsearch um, and Logstash to, to to drive that automation. And um, we'll call that the end. Um, <laughs> so uh, these slides, as I mentioned, they're available in a Git repository. They get published to this location just like all the rest of the OpenStack docs whenever we make a change to them. Um, so uh, are there any questions? Um, yeah, you heard Um, so we we have a we're we're adding new tests all the time and we're adding new jobs all the time too. Uh, we we have a workflow around adding new jobs where we sort of we run them uh, in an experimental stage off in the corner on request and they don't they don't do anything they don't report anything back to developers uh, and then as they become more stable we sort of we run them s uh, silently to. Uh, so that they get run more, but they're still not reporting back. But we can we can go and look at the output and find out whether it's working or not. And then finally, once we're satisfied with a, with a new job, we start having it uh, report uh, back as well. Um, most of this stuff is all self-gating too. So if you're adding a new test, um, that test is going to be run uh, as part of its um, merge proposal, and so uh, it's only going to land in the in the repository if it passes its tests itself. So, yes? Uh, I have a question. How, you said, like you said, you can configure OpenStack in so many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, how many configurations do you actually test and how do you sort together? Or do you just have a base set? Right. Okay, so uh, the, 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 here's the slide that I skipped. Um, so, up, upstream, uh, we have uh, a couple of really popular configurations. That, uh, that we can test in our virtualized cloud environment. So, you know, we test with MySQL and Postgres, and uh, we test with Rabbit and sometimes zero MQ, but maybe not right now. Uh, yeah, at, at any rate, so we, we pick a couple of popular things be, uh, and, and we try to make sure those, those work. Uh, and then we have this extensible system where <clears throat> anybody can run their own testing infrastructure and have it report back to our Garrett. So if, if you're like, well, I need the, this to run on this particular real, it really expensive networking switch. Um, you can set that up in your lab and have it report back in an advisory fashion uh, so developers can see those results. Yes? I have to explain this in the beginning because I missed the first minutes. But uh, why, what's the reason behind the licensing choice? Why, why Apache? Why Apache? Um, so that was, I mean, OpenStack was basically started by Rackspace and NASA um, very early on, and then they they uh, got some you know some other big companies uh, along in the beginning. And honestly, I guess that was that was the license that people those people were comfortable with. Um, it's there's a really interesting thing in our community in that um, it is it is Apache licensed, which means of course anybody can take this and stick it in proprietary products. Um, if you do that and you don't contribute back to the community, um, the community doesn't really interact with you very much. Um, you know, there's there's very strong pressure to to if you're if you're actually doing any work uh, on on OpenStack uh, to contribute your changes upstream. Uh, you know, we're trying to to build that kind of collaborative environment. Um, so, all right. Uh, thanks. <laughs>